President Trump finishing up a rally in Pennsylvania to his signature closing song, You Can't Always Get What You Want, from the Rolling Stones. Just before our show started, the president spoke about immigration and the wall, a hot topic in Washington as Republicans on the Hill have basically said they're refusing to fund the wall that the president promised. Let's take a listen as we watch the president live on one side of your screen. Here's what he said a little uh, 40 minutes ago or so. The Democrats, anything I want, and it's not even the Republicans. I don't know if they care about the Republicans. They care about me. They're very concerned. Anything I want, they want to oppose. You know, I just figured out how to do the wall. I'll say, I don't want to build the wall, and they'll insist on building it. That's Janine Pirro was watching the rally closely and assessing it. She's the host, obviously, of Justice with Judge Janine. She's the author of a new book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, and we're happy to have her on the show tonight. Judge, what do you think of it? Well, I thought it was uh, vintage Donald Trump. I think that he gets energy from the audience. They get energy from him. He was everything. He was entertaining. He was positive. He was funny. But more importantly, he had a message of success that energized Pennsylvania. And I love the way he talked about American history and Pennsylvania and the role that they played of steel mills and railroads. And, and you know, my own dad was from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and veterans. I mean, it was all good stuff, and that audience loves him. And he will do this constantly until the 2018 elections. So you've talked to the president. I have to ask, because we, we have a lot of his rallies during our show, so I listen to all of them. And toward the end, he always mentions Space Force. Yeah. And I've never really heard it discussed anywhere but at his rallies. When you talk to him, do you sense this is something close to his heart? Uh, yes, and I want to talk to him more about Space Force, and maybe we'll be able to get some more information. But clearly, this is a man who is not satisfied with just getting you know, better unemployment, although he's going to work for lower women's unemployment, which I thought was kind of interesting, um, and all of the positive things. He's thinking about the future, not just now. But that is classic Donald Trump. He is a success in everything that he does. He is is a positive guy. And, you know, after one of these uh, rallies, you say to yourself, what does he do? I mean, you know, you, and the people in the audience, they don't go home and go to sleep. Everyone's too fired up. They love America. They love the success story. They love hearing about people who've lost everything and who are now able to go to a president who's going to make things happen, whether it's the veteran who needs medical help or the steel worker or someone who is fearful of the problems with immigration and NATO. And he's right. You know, $200 billion, nobody even talks about it. $50 billion tariff benefit right now, no one talks about it. The American people do want to hear it, and he is his best messenger. Judge Jean Pirro, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. A new book by Judge Jeanine. I think it's out in stores now. Okay. Great to see you, Judge. Thank you very Good much. To see you, Tucker. I want to tell you about something else that happened today because we think it tells you a lot about where this country is moving. When you were growing up, you probably learned one of the most basic moral principles that there is. You ought to treat other people as individuals for who they are, not on the basis of how they look or who their parents are, what their parents did. You ought to judge people for what they do and what they say for the choices they make. That was a good principle. We haven't always followed it as individuals or as a country, but we ought to try to follow it as best we can are hardest because bigotry diminishes and hurts people. It's pretty simple. And yet somehow, over time, the institutional left has decided to reject that idea and embrace a standard that is both new and time-worn. You may have assumed that race guilt, collective punishment, moral purity based on bloodline, you thought those were discredited ideas, creepy relics of a darker time. It turns out they're not. It turns out the New York Times wholeheartedly embraces those ideas. So does much of the left. Yesterday, the Times announced it was hiring a woman called Sarah Jong to write about technology for the paper. Within hours, readers discovered Jong's Twitter feed, which she had not bothered to delete, apparently because she was not embarrassed by it. Judging by what she wrote on Twitter, Sarah Jong is an angry bigot, and not in a subtle way. Here are some examples of her tweets. Quote, oh man, it's kind of sick how much joy I get out of being cruel to old white men. Another, quote, Dumbass effing white people marking up the internet with their opinions like dogs peeing on fire hydrants. Another, quote, hashtag cancel white people. 
At one point, Zhang tweeted a crude graph claiming that as whiteness increased, so did awful. Later, she said that white people smell like dogs. Here's another one. Quote, white people have stopped breeding. You'll all go extinct soon. That was my plan all along. And on and on. Well, people are getting fired for far less than this across corporate America right now. But the New York Times decided to double down on Sarah Zhang's behalf. Here's part of the statement the paper sent out about her. Quote, Zhang's journalism and the fact she is a young Asian woman have made her a subject of frequent online harassment. For a period of time, she responded to that harassment by imitating the rhetoric of her harassers. In other words, it's not her fault. White racism caused Sarah Zhang's racism against white people. She's the victim here, Harvard graduate, oppressed person that she is. Some of Zhang's many defenders in the press accused her critics of taking her tweets out of context, but that's not true. We checked. There's no context for these tweets. Sarah Zhang was furious at an entire race of people, and she said so on Twitter. You'd think somewhere on the left, the last responsible person would be cringing at all of this. It's all so ugly and awful. In an earlier time, it would be considered indefensible. But modern progressives are happy not simply to defend it, but to attack anyone who questions the joy that Sarah Zhang derives from being cruel to white men. Lydia Paul Green, the editor-in-chief of HuffPo, who is widely regarded by her peers as a moron, announced that criticism of Zhang is, quote, part of a deeply troubling trend of far-right agitators trying to get journalists fired. Far-right agitators, okay. But actually, we're not calling on Zhang to be fired. We're not liberals, so we don't believe that every person we disagree with ought to be crushed, including Sarah Zhang. We believe in free speech, even when it's reprehensible, maybe especially when it is. What we would like to see, though, is some honesty. Let's all stop lying for a minute. What Sarah Zhang said was wrong, but it was only shocking because she expressed it so clearly. In point of fact, her views are commonplace in the American establishment, maybe universal. Try to find a single government bureaucrat or college administrator or head of corporate HR who disagrees with the idea that people should be judged by the color of their skin and that some races are more virtuous and deserving than other races. They all think that, every one of them. And yet, remarkably, these very same people are the quickest to cry racism at the slightest provocation or for no reason at all. They think of themselves as arch enemies of racism. They get tattoos on their arm telling you that, and yet they're its chief purveyors. Deep, deep irony. How do they do that? Well, simple. They redefine the term. As Vice.com succinctly put it a couple of years ago, quote, it is literally impossible to be racist to a white person. Pretty much the entire left now takes that as a matter of faith. They deeply believe that. But what does that mean exactly? Is there really an entire race of people so repulsive, so morally repugnant that it is, quote, literally impossible to wrong them? You could do anything to people like that and not feel bad about it. In fact, why wouldn't you? They deserve it. They're not really human. That's the attitude. It's not hard to guess where ideas like that wind up. We've seen it. All of us should be afraid of it. All of us, regardless of color. There are plenty of examples in history of what happens when people start thinking this way. And they're all sad. It's awful. And yet this is the mindset the left has imposed on our country. It's an attitude designed to dehumanize the individual, to erase what makes each of us interesting and distinct and vital, and reduce us to faceless members of a group. It's totalitarian. We ought to resist it with everything that we have. Tammy Bruce is a radio show host in New York and a frequent guest on the show. She joins us tonight. And bravo. Tammy, thanks a lot for coming on. Bravo opening Thank statement. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, it just seems obvious. It's, I, you know, anybody over 35 grew up learning that you ought to judge people by what they do and say and the choices they make and not by their race because right. they can't control their race. And right. yet, without the rest of us sort of acknowledging or saying anything, the left has turned that on its head and now it is unacceptable to say that. What happened exactly? Well, well, look, I think this is what the left has done wherever it has uh, gained some sort of power around the world. Uh, it survives by dividing and conquering, right? And, and the New York That's Times, interestingly, has a, an editorial position that really does uh, inflame, if you will, it's like a little cottage industry of creating kind of a, a, a racialist uh, guide for division and resentment. Uh, you see it in their editorial pieces. You see it in the columnists as well. Uh, and this is why I think uh, this young woman will fit uh, right in. Now, at the same time, as you've noted, 
we're not looking for someone to get fired, but there is a hypocrisy here where nobody also knows what the rules are. So you, you, the rules are different for a certain group of people. They're different for people of color, perhaps, but really that's what they want you to think. The real difference here, Tucker, is progressives, right? And they're using issues of race, uh, let's say, of sexuality, of gender, in order to create those divisions. So in this case, uh, another woman had been hired by the New York Times uh, last February, also a tech writer, to be on the editorial board. And she was exposed as having some tweets uh, uh, against, uh, there was a slur used for African Americans and for gays. And she was immediately fired. Now, it, it, the reason was, was because her crime was against progressives. Uh, and the difference right. here is, of course, is that the presumption is and the message to, to liberals is if you if you are going to belong, if you're going to be correct, if you're going to be saved, uh, you can't be with conservatives or uh, people who are just simply not paying allegiance uh, to the progressive end. That's what this is. Now, the danger in a way of what this young woman will be doing at the Times. And I think bad ideas should be out in the open so that we can confront them. I agree. Right? Uh, I in, agree completely. In, in this instance, she'll be part of the editorial board that issues editorials that are not signed. There are no bylines to the editorials. A and that what they right. set the tone for the paper itself. So it's a harder dynamic to argue directly to someone when you're when it is a, a an organizational position. So so this is no, what removes totally us from point. this. Yeah. All right. The fact that they're teaching our children that some groups can be discriminated against Really wrong, and I think that we should call them out on it. Timmy, it is. great to see you. Thank Thanks. you for having me. British journalist Tommy Robinson spent two months in jail for attempting to cover a sexual abuse trial. Journalists in Great Britain and the United States applauded his sentence. Now he's finally been released from jail, and he joins us here exclusively next. The United Kingdom has become a mere shadow of the nation that gave us freedom of speech, freedom of the press, a host of other rights that we take for granted but probably should not take for granted. Nobody knows that better than Tommy Robinson. In May of this year, he was arrested for attempting to cover the trial of a sexual grooming gang in the UK for speaking out loud on the sidewalk. He was taken to prison with barely any time to muster a defense. He was tried and sentenced to 13 months in jail. Now, after more than two months behind bars in solitary confinement, during which time he was attacked by journalists in, U in the UK. Almost nobody defended him. But tonight he has been released on bail after winning an appeal. Tommy Robinson joins us now for his first and only interview. Tommy Robinson, thank you very much uh, for agreeing to talk to us. I know that you've spent the last two and a half months by yourself in a cell, so you're probably feeling a little bit uh, bewildered to be out. Tell us what it was like for you behind bars. For me, behind bars... It, the way I was treated, I was taken to a prison with, a, with quite a low Muslim population. What I'm known for is criticizing Islam, so there's been many att planned att attempts to murder me and kill me in this country. I was taken to a, a, a prison with a low Muslim population of 7%, where things were relatively normal. I was separated from other prisoners, but the prison officers made sure they opened my doors multiple times during the day, and they took me out to play pool and snooker with themselves. I was then taken from that prison and transferred to another prison. And I was transferred to the prison with the largest Muslim population in the UK for a CCAT prison. I was then put on, put on solitary confinement where I spent two months um, not seeing or speaking to anybody. And they used the reason that I was in danger. Now, they would have had risk assessments before I went there. I was purposely taken to be put in danger so that then that reason can be used to then put me on solitary confinement. And if you think about what has happened in this case, it took a number of hours to put, take me before court, prosecute me, unlawfully imprison me, and then it took two months with the prisons moving me to prevent my legal access, shortening my legal visits, and it took months before I got the opportunity to go before a judge. Once the judge heard what had happened in the trial, we found so many illegal and wrongdoings within this kangaroo court that then it took another two weeks before I was freed. And to, and to be honest, this whole encounter if you talk about i, I haven't eaten I've, lo I've lost nearly nearly 40 pounds in prison i had a one tin of tuna and a piece of fruit a day i i was supposed to be in her majesty's prison service not guantanamo bay i couldn't open my windows because i was having excrement and spit put through them i had i believe this whole process and tucker this isn't the first well, i'm sorry to interrupt but who this is putting excrement through your window and spit through your window 
So my, my, my prison cell that I was put in was on the lower level, the ground level, which it didn't have to be. So it's on the ground level. So every prisoner would walk past my cell window, every one as they walk out. So when my windows were open, there were, every prisoner's walking past. But the mosque for the prison was directly opposite my cell. So every time, and we've had a huge heat waves, I was literally drenched day to day, and I had excrement and spit thrown through, through the doors, thrown through my windows. So in the end, I had completely blocked up windows, I had to block up all of my, my cell windows. And all of this, when, when I say this, uh, to a lot of people around the world, this, what, this current case, and the world has watched it, has shocked them. For me, this has been nothing new. There's some things I have not spoke about in the past, where in, in, in 2012, I spent five months on solitary confinement in the British prison. This is, goes against every human right and every law. I spent five months, I'm sorry, when, when I come out, I was diagnosed with a, a form of, of post-traumatic stress disorder. I've never spoke about that publicly because I don't want to insult victim, p members of the military who have witnessed war and try and compare being locked in a cell in sort of solitary confinement to that. But the, my medical records are fully aware that the authorities are fully aware of them, the government are fully aware of them, the prison service are fully aware of them. They know what that did to me. They know what I went through after that. They elite, uh, but I guess what, put me wait, in a may I interrupt you? I, I, I just want to under. Uh, I just want our viewers to understand yeah. why this happened to you in the first place. You went to prison in a supposedly free country for expressing unfashionable opinions in public. Did you, no. with this last no. round, you've been in jail for two months? Did you hit anybody? Did you steal anything, or did you say something the government didn't like? There was a court case going on where 29 people were in court for gang raping up to 100 young children. Now, I stood outside the court and I, I, I spoke and all I done was read a BBC News article, a BBC News article that is still online now for millions of people to see. Now, I, and I was taken and everyone would have watched the video. They said for a breach of the peace, they transported me to a police custody and then my solicitor contacted the police custody. Then they emailed my solicitor, which my solicitor has this email saying I was being released. Then they took me in a van back to the court through the back door. They put me up before a judge and media reports have said that I pled guilty. These are at no point was I even asked whether I was guilty or not guilty. I was not even told, and I still, to this point now, have not been told and do not know what it is I'm deemed to have done wrong. In a British court of law for a fair trial for anyone, they have to understand what it is they're being accused of. Contempt of court. That's all I've been told. What, what contempt of court? I, I was fully aware outside that court. I made sure to point out that these men are innocent until proven guilty. I said alleged. I was non-confrontational. There is no, the judges, and I know the law, the judges have no power to issue reporting restrictions on anybody, on any information that is already in the public domain. I was taken and whisked away, and what we've seen this week is the highest judge in our, our country has completely condemned this as flawed, completely criticised the, the handling of this case, the kangaroo court style it was to imprison me, and my biggest concern with it is, at, at this time, that when this has happened, and so many people, I, 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 I say thank you to the Middle East Forum, a thank you to Congressman Gosar, a, a thank you to uh, Ambassador Brownback, people, a thank you to yourself, Tucker, people who come out, because we know that in, in this country, anyone who speaks about Islam, you can believe him a complete liberal, the minute you mention, criticise Islam, you are deemed and attacked by everybody. Now, and people put their neck on the line. Did any, let me just ask you now, did anyone defend you? I mean, even if people disagree with you, you would think some would say he has a right, this man has a right to express his opinions. Did anybody defend your right to say what you think is true? Everyone of authority and every media company and mainstream media lined up and lined up to completely do hatchet jobs about why I should be in prison and how I deserve to be in prison. And hum one, the worst one, I'm reading a human rights lawyer, a human rights lawyer defending why I should be in prison. Now, I'm in prison, I'm facing absolute, yep. they know they're, what they're doing to me. They, they know, at, at the time when I was in prison, I, I then, they then come and see me in my prison cell and say, police are on their way to your house because there's intel there's going to be acid attacks against your wife. Now, uh, uh, and then, and I'm, then I'm sorry, to Tommy, we're, we're out of, we're out of time. Okay. And on that sad note, I just, I, I wish uh, you good luck in recovering from this and on the time you're going to take off. And I just want our viewers to understand that this has happened in a country that we believed was free, and without our vigilance, it could happen here. That's not hysteria. It's real. Tommy Robinson, like to thank, thank you very so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Paul Manafort's trial just wrapped up its third day. The government revealed more of its case for putting Manafort in prison for more than 30 years for a crime that usually draws a sentence of a year and three months. We've got more on that coming up. Well, the trial of former Donald Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort completed its third day today. Prosecutors brought out evidence that Manafort lived a luxurious lifestyle, bought suits they suggested were too expensive for one man to buy, maintained overseas accounts, and then lied about his income on loan applications. This was all to bolster their case that Paul Manafort deserves more prison time than most murderers. More than once during the trial, the judge, T.S. Ellis III, blasted prosecutors for simply shaming Manafort without offering any actual evidence of criminal behavior. Joe DeGeneva is a former U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, and he joins us tonight. Joe, thanks a lot for coming on. I never thought that I would defend Paul Manafort, who I've always thought was a little on the sleazy side, but I think it's worth defending the principle of evenly and fairly applied justice, and it's not a crime to buy expensive suits. And you shouldn't get 300 years in prison for tax evasion, right? You're absolutely right, Tucker. What you are watching is what, it, what is called in the Justice Department an interorum prosecution. The use of terror legal tactics to destroy a human being to try and force him to cooperate when he has nothing to cooperate with. And what the special counsel has done, Mr. Mueller, is he has chosen his Jack the Ripper-like leader, Andrew Weissman, to use the type of tactics that are properly reserved for mafia gangs, for terrorists, and they have converted Paul Manafort into this ugly creature. This is one of the most unfortunate moments in the history of the, of the FBI and the Department of Justice. This, this case is the Rosemary's baby of Rod Rosenstein, who forced this prosecution, permitted the abusive tactics which occurred during the investigation and which are occurring in this trial, agreed to by the FBI Director Chris Wray, and of course, the Attorney General is asleep, somnambulant, as this horrific embarrassment to the department continues in the Eastern District of Virginia. This is a disgusting display of prosecutorial abuse for which the Attorney General and his deputy should be ashamed. Is there anybody that you know personally who'd with a straight face say, yeah, 305 years in prison seems like an appropriate punishment for tax evasion? Is there anybody who would say that? No is the answer. So how can they charge him with crimes so the sentence is so clearly disproportionate to the crime because the deputy attorney general mr rosenstein has given mr muller full authority to do whatever he wants and because the ultimate goal here is to quote get something on president trump they've decided to ruin paul manafort who has no criminal record whatever you may think of his political leanings and his tactics over the years or who his overseas clients were he does not deserve this the Attorney General knows that, the Deputy Attorney know, General knows that, but you know what? They don't care because they know that Mueller wants to get Trump. That's what this is about. There's nothing for Manafort to flip on, for heaven's sakes. So what you are watching is a bizarre mistreatment of a human being. This is a case that should get one to three years at most, but Mueller and exactly. Weissman and all the people in the department just can't give it up. 1.3 years, a year and three months, rather. That's the average sentence for tax fraud in this country. It's unbelievable. Joe DeGeneva, thank you for that perspective. This is your world, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Tucker. Well, while President Trump was in Helsinki, former President Obama went to Johannesburg, South Africa, and gave a speech. The parts of the speech people noticed were the ones where he attacked President Trump. But he said something almost unbelievable in another part of the speech that nobody caught. We did. We'll tell you what it is when we come back. At about the same time President Trump was at his summit in Helsinki, former President Barack Obama was in South Africa delivering a speech that didn't get too much attention, though it should have. Obama began his remarks by thanking South African President Cyril Ramaphosa for, quote, inspiring new hope in this great country. Now, if you've been following what's going on in South Africa, you might be shocked by that. 
because it turns out Ramaphosa recently declared that he will change the South African Constitution and he'll do it for the explicit purpose of persecuting a racial minority, seizing their land without compensation, not because they've committed a specific crime, but because they are the wrong color, purely on racial grounds. Thanks to policies like this, many South Africans have already been murdered in race killings. Many and many more are fleeing the country for their lives. It's not covered here, but it's covered in the rest of the world, and it's real. Obama knew all this. He described it as, quote, inspiring, and that should tell you a lot. He should be asked why he described it as inspiring. He never will be, unfortunately. Well, that's about it for us tonight. Our weekly news quiz final exam was preempted for the president tonight, but we can promise you it'll be outstanding. Our reigning champion, Kitty Pavlich, is on vacation, but we have two huge figures from the world of weather competing against each other, so tune in tomorrow night for that. And every night to the show that is the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink, DVR it if you can. I can't, but good luck to you, and more than anything... Have a great night tonight. Sean Hannity, coming up next. Hey, Sean. Hey, Tucker. Great show as always. And good to see you. Hang on. i got to fix Thank my you. button. Hang on. They're yelling at me. Fix your button. All right. There we go. But I, you fix, need a button. Yeah, I'll button. give you one. Uh, <laughs> great show. All right. Well,